going to Billboard was very key and very critical. Well, of course, that's when I really learned about the music business because I stayed there almost four years. And uh, I had, at that time, my intentions were not uh, making records or being in the music. My intentions were to write fiction. And I was starting to write short stories and have them published in the quality literary magazines and so on. And so I had a degree in journalism. And so when I came to Billboard, they were very pleased to, to know that I could handle a semicolon. So they gave me a lot of the rewrite to do, as well as my own copy. And uh, I was obsessive. I mean, I, I knew I wanted to make good. And in those days, nowadays, uh, there are two ways that, uh, really only one way, well, let's say two ways that the trade papers in which they operate. One is on the telephone, and the other is printing handouts from the, from the record companies, printing the puffs. But in those days, we actually used to go out Shanksmere and cover a beat. I'd start at the top floor of the Brill Building and work my way down, stop in every office with my notepad, and bring in topical news, as well as covering uh, major trade stories, such as... Uh, the consent decree that BMI and ASCAP entered into with the government, uh, the uh, emergence of BMI as a real rival for ASCAP. Um, we tried also to do really investigative reporting, and we did, such as how ASCAP assigned uh, its revenues to the members and we found out that there was favoritism going on and uh, there was some, trick, some little tricks and scams going on. But uh, BMI also had some interesting uh, aspects because in, in order to uh, develop sources of material, of music, they would finance uh, people to start little publishing companies. And they take a song plugger, say a guy named Nicky Campbell, who was a song plugger, and they'd finance him to start his own publishing company, and then he would give the performing rights to BMI. So it always behooved me to find out how much the capitalization was for. And of course, it was always fun because they would get very angry and get very mad and do things like threatening to pull their advertising and so on. And I should mention uh, that my editor for most of these years was not Joe Carlton, who left soon after I came in, but a wonderful man named Paul Ackerman, who's a legend in this business. And uh, I wrote his uh, eulogy when he passed in 1977. And uh, Paul had a master's degree in Lake Poets, I can you imagine? I mean, he's a, a scholar of English literature, so he was a wonderful writer. And I, I learned a lot from him. And a very irascible, old-time American-Irish drunk sitting in the slot, the head of the copy desk, who really cut me down when I came in with my fancy polysyllables, you know. And he taught me about one-syllable Anglo-Saxon words, you know, to make it short and make it quick. So... Who was that? Uh, what the heck was his name? I can't recall his name, but it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, so was it at Billboard that your taste expanded from jazz into other musics and other? I don't know about my how my taste expanded, uh, because my taste it, it did not follow the market curve, and it didn't follow necessarily the. the the so-called more important records. I still preferred the blues and loved the R&B. And I, I loved Atlantic's records. Uh, and I had a predilection for the kind of music they were making. And so also, they were my friends, so in case of a tie, they won, you know. <laughs> what were those first uh, Atlantic songs that you heard before you were there that you remember being impressed? Oh, well, uh, 
mama, he treats your daughter mean. Drinking wine, Spodioti, which was their first hit. Uh, then there were a couple of jazz records they made with, uh, what was his name? There were, there were two. Eddie Safransky, the bass player. Because when Armand and Herb started to record, they naturally were thinking big band and jazz. And then there was a very modern band. Uh, I just can't think of the name right now. And uh, their capital, which they had borrowed from a, a dentist, a, a Turkish dentist in Washington, evaporated. It disappeared. It was $15,000 on these two sessions. And they had to start again. So they went and begged and borrowed some other kind of money, as Dr. John would say. And uh, they started again, and they lucked up on drinking wine spodioti. Uh, that, probably that story's been told, but uh, this record, Drinking Wine Spodioti, came out, not on Atlantic, but I forget on what label, and uh, Ahmed and Herb were talking to their distributor in New Orleans in those days, the independents. They were independent more by virtue of how they distributed their records than anything else. They distributed through independent distributors who were not employees of a major uh, uh, a major record apparatus. They were, all, they were their own people. And this particular man happened to mention that he could use several thousand of this record. So Ahmed hurried, hurried back to New York and uh, they found the original singer who was doing this, Stick McGee. How did they know him through his brother? Anyhow, they went in and they made the same record and it was really practically identical to the other one, but through uh, the fickle finger of fortune, that became the hit and Atlantic was on its way with, uh, it wasn't technically, uh, R&B, it was blues, it was a blues record. And it was rough and raggedy, but it had a lot of energy and it projected. So you must have liked their, their who produced as well, it probably matched your own, I mean. Rhythm and blues? No, I mean, Ahmet and Herb, the, 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 their who produced it, uh, going and finding that song and doing that. I mean, that's, uh, that's fairly, um, you know, that's pretty bold. Yeah, well, it's, uh, they were pioneers, and they had to make moves like this, the way Sam Phillips was doing in Memphis, and uh, the way people like Lou Chud were doing with Fats Domino and Art Roop with Little Richard. What's interesting to me, I resigned from Atlantic in 1975, but the fact is that Atlantic is a major label now. And at that time, it was one of dozens, maybe scores, of record, record labels just about the same size. Every one of them is gone. There's not a one that's left. Uh, the Motown, for example, came 10 years later. And uh, you wouldn't say that, that, that this at this moment that a Motown is a howling success. Uh, so Atlantic endured. And uh, I was interviewed one time. And I said, to, to what? how do you figure this? And uh, we would call the Little Tiffany and so on. So tongue in cheek, but kidding on a square, I, this, I said, this has to do with the nature of the owners and the executives of the company on the three elements, taste, intelligence, and probity. <laughs> kidding on the square. Um, going back to when Herb and uh, Ahmed were rolling around on the floor, what was your, what did, what did you think of that? time that you could contribute to a record company? I had no idea, I mean, except that I felt that I knew as much about the history of the music and uh, the, uh, the foundations of the music as they, we were peers in that respect. And I guess it was just sort of a, Again, a, a wild, you know, egotistical, hubristic stab without any real foundation. And you'd have to ask 
somebody else why they took that chance on me. And because uh, friendship alone, it's not good enough reason to risk your fortune, you know, they're, they're, they're little moiety. <laughs> to give a bunch of it away. Yeah. So you, you started to mention before the first time you went into the studio. Tell me about that. Eddie. Well, the first, my first record was with Laverne Baker. And uh, Ahmed and I and Jesse Stone, the arranger, uh, among the three of us, we wrote two songs that went into the session. And one of them is still good, called Soul on Fire. Uh, it was covered recently by uh, what's her name from New Orleans, the great lady who plays like fat, like uh, Professor Long here. Marsha Ball, uh, much to my delight, recorded "Soul on Fire" a few years ago, uh, probably for the Anthone label. And Marsha has always been one of my favorites. In 1972 or 73, one of my best friends in the business among performers has been and still is Doug Som, from the Sir Douglas Quintet. And he induced me to record Marsha Ball, who then had a country band uh, under the name of Freed and the Fire Dogs in Tyler, Texas. And we went down there and made this record. It was never quite finished, but I have the tapes. And uh, when I say not quite finished, the vocals are there, the rhythm is there, maybe it would need just a touch of sweetening. And it was a wonderful record. Please note that it's in tune. I'm sure it is. <laughs> I had somebody do that. I mean, it was out of tune for years, and I couldn't do it. I guess that would be really annoying for you. Oh, God. <laughs> i tell you what, when I was a kid at home, you know, at my house we had one of these. And so, but my mother gave it to my brother. And I was always jealous of that, my younger brother, my dear younger brother who passed away a few years ago. And uh, so his family still has the original with the Westminster chime. So I made it a point to find one. These are hard to find. And it was out of tune, let's say, say for years, but we finally got it fixed. Do you have good ear uh, pitch? Fantastic, I must say. <laughs> I mean, I'm, well, how can I say that on tape? I mean, nah. Uh, Let's go back to Laverne Baker. Yeah. <laughs> because you were saying before that you had never been in the studio, you thought it was so easy until you got to the Yeah, and when I got to the studio and I realized that the clock was running at union rates and these musicians were sitting out there who clearly could play their instruments and knew their music. And I, you know, with my you know, blithering ignorance, was sitting there. I don't know if I said a word. I just like, you know, I ran the session. That, that may have gone on for quite a while, for, for several years before I uh, ventured to make a peep. Uh, but maybe, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, I earned my grits by coming to work early in the morning and becoming the daily op man, we're running a company uh, from 11 o'clock on, and then recording at night. We would record three, four nights a week in those days because we put out three singles every month, and we had a wonderful roster of repeating artists. Uh, that, uh, for example, we, I remember that the nut that we had to make, we had to sell 60,000 singles a month, 60,000, there were no LPs, to pay for the whole operation. That would be the rent, our salaries, uh, the session costs, advances to artists, and so on. But we had a, a fantastic roster in those days. People like, you know, Joe Turner, or the Drifters, the Coasters, uh, courtesy of Lieber and Stoller, Laverne Baker, Ivory Joe Hunter, um, Ruth Brown, uh, a great group called the Diamonds. Uh, we had a, 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 from 1960 on Solomon Burke, eventually in Wilson Pickett, but even in the 50s, we had enough good artists 
to almost guarantee, of course, there are no ironclad guarantees, that we could make the nut every month. And we developed a practice of of warehousing good songs for our artists. Most rhythm and blues companies didn't do that. If a, a songwriter came in with a song and it sounded good, they generally take him into the studio and make a record with him. Whether it would be chess or miracle or specialty. But what we we always believed in the notion of bel canto. We believed in singers. We believed in singers with voices. And when you think of the Atlantic roster, I mean, Joe Turner could have been an opera singer. I mean, his voice was so gorgeous. And Laverne Baker, to me, she always was sort of, she replicated Mahalia Jackson. She had that great sound. Uh, Solomon Burke, one of the sweetest blues singers, or, or rhythm and blues and gospel singers, so when a good song would come in, we would buy the publishing rights and warehouse it and then assign it to one of our artists. Whose idea was that? I don't know. I mean, it was, you know, I, this was a joint venture, and we, Ahmed and I really worked very closely together. At this time, Herb was not uh, with us because he was in the Army. He owed them some service time because he had gotten a medical degree in dentistry, as a matter of fact, courtesy of the Army. And he had, and that was why, by the way, uh, why they took me in to replace Herb. It was just another body, a breathing body, to come in and be... I think that's mostly how they viewed me. And uh, that was a, uh, an optimistic uh, assessment. If you don't have a hit single, it doesn't matter, you know, how meritorious the album is, how great it is sonically, or. It's just another album. I probably had the same problem with people like Alan Tucson, because uh, Alan thinks that the thing, the album we did called Motion is memorable, but no hits. He just had come off Southern Nights. It was a smash, but that's luck of the draw, especially with singers who write their own material. Well, that hasn't changed. It's sort of the nature of the business that yeah. uh, you know, the single leads the album. Yeah. Of course, with Bob Dylan, that's never a question. <laughs> However it happened that Ahmed and I, we clicked immediately. And I can't you know, say how much was because of my presence and my input, which I think was uh, exiguous at best in the beginning, especially. But we learned to work with each other very well. And we really ham and egged it beautifully in the studio for years. And don't you know, we had a terrific run of hits. And when Harry Baverson came back, Ahmed and I were now definitely a working team. And where Ahmed and Herb had been the duo before, so what we did was create another label called ADCO for it to be Herb's domain, and that became a very successful label, I don't have to tell you, with, uh, first of all, with Bobby Darren, and then the coasters, and so on. And uh, so Herb was sort of uh, working by himself with the ADCO label. Uh, Herb had signed Bobby Darren, for example. But it's interesting that Ahmed was the one who got the first hit on Bobby Darren, Splish Splash, which I thought was a piece of crap. <laughs> but. Bobby Darren, we did a split session with, of all people, Morgana King, the jazz singer. Each one did two sides. Uh, according to the union rules in those days, you were allowed to do four sides in three hours for scale before you went into overtime. And overtime was definitely verboten. That was a no-no. You had to get it in. So uh, when Herb came back, he uh, ran the ATCO label. Eventually, Herb asked out. Eventually, Miriam left the company, too. Nessui came in, I think, in 55. And he came in as a partner. We all chipped in and gave him shares of stock and so on. And, uh, and 
Nestle joining the company really put us on the map with uh, two aspects. The long playing record, which we now went into, and jazz. And Nestle created a, what at the time was a, maybe the um, platonic ideal of a jazz record label with, uh, well, as I said, Herbie Mann, uh, Annette Coleman, John Coltrane, Chris Connor, uh, Les McCann, Eddie Harris, uh, uh, the Modern Jazz Quartet, a uh, wonderful label, I, you know, just instantly out of nowhere. Uh, so that was his domain, and Ahmed and I continued to work together now, as cohorts. Ahmed and you had actually, and correct me if I'm wrong, very different tastes in music. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, well, Bobby Darren is maybe, uh, is, is, I mean, what you disagreed over that song. Um, how was your... Wait, wait, well, first of all, we were in total agreement about Bobby Darren, because uh, I thought Bobby... We both knew that Bobby Darren was enormously talented. Now, I just didn't believe in that song. So this has nothing to do... That's the end, 15 after. Uh, so this has nothing to do with taste. This has to do with commercial assessment that I thought the song was a stiff, and I'm a thought it was a hit. So, yes always wins. There is no power of veto. If somebody wants to do it, it was done at that company. And, and the way Ahmed and I uh, worked together, the way we interrelated. One last question about the early days. Uh, Miriam, was she, it seemed like she was running the office without, you know, while the visionaries were out making the music, she was... Well, yeah, she held everything together, took care of the payroll, took care of, you know, the pressings. We we didn't own a pressing plant. We had to uh, do our pressings uh, through custom uh, pressing plants, mastering, uh, office supervision. Uh, she did all of that. I mean, my first day at Atlantic, I probably came in at 10 or 11 in the morning, and she said, good morning, and dumped the mail on my desk, and says, here, go to work, you know. And so, oh, absolutely, uh, that was her domain, and she did it very well. I mean, obviously, it's essential to have a rock there when you've got other, you know. Exactly. Um, all right, so let's move, let me just ask you about some artists very quickly. Yeah. Ray Charles, uh, who had been there already and recorded up on 56th Street there. Um, what was your first uh, introduction to him? Uh, I don't know if I participated in the sessions before he had his own orchestra, his own band, uh, which th there were some pretty good records, like uh, Sinner's Prayer, which was a Lowell Fulson song. Uh, these were ready, regular studio sessions whereby we found the material, we got the arranger, probably Jesse Stone, and uh, picked the musicians. But at one point, I guess it must have been 1954, Ray called us down to Atlanta and uh, said, I have a band now, and we'd like you to come down and do a record here. So we went down to Atlanta, and Ray was staying across the way from a nightclub called The Peacock. There was a hotel associated with it, and Ray stayed at the hotel. And we met him at The Peacock. He said, okay, we're ready to, you, if you fellas are ready to hear something, I got something to play for you. He literally ran down the stairs, crossed the alley, up to the Peacock, up to the, uh, the main room, that, you know, the, uh, uh, whatever would be the performing room at the Peacock, the nightclub. And there's this band, uh, four horns and three rhythm, no guitar. And to me, by the way, just as a sidelight, it's one of the most interesting things to me about Ray Charles's fantastic career that it was done without a guitar, except in very few cases where he would maybe use a guitar to play a blues line, but not for rhythm, because the guitar would have clashed with Ray's piano chords. And Ray's 
piano playing is the basis of Ray Charles' genius and his success. Because not only for his compositions, which he composed on the piano, and where he developed his great harmonies, which are a combination of gospel and blues, but also they were the roadmap for the arrangements. Now, the piano in a band, a rock and roll band or a blues band or any other kind of small combo band, has two jobs. One, it must contribute to the rhythm and lock in with the bass and the keyboard and the guitar if there is one. But two, it must also serve as accompaniment to the vocalist, which uh, the two are almost contradictory because you had to furnish the building blocks, the foundation, at the same time supporting the singer and one of the most significant integral parts of accompaniment on a piano is the notes that you don't play. When to lay out and let the singer have it. Now, brilliant accompanists like Tommy Flanagan, for example, you know, who was Ella Fitzgerald's for years, or Ellis Larkin, who was one of the greatest that we've ever had, accompany singers. Uh, what was my point about them? Oh, basically, they functioned as accompanists. But Ray Charles had to play as a rhythm ingredient and as an accompaniment, accompanist for himself. Now, the two things about Ray's compositions and piano playing, they served as accompaniment for his singing because he knew at the end of an instrumental line where he was going to come in. He knew that better than anybody possibly could. But also, they furnished the basis for the horn charts because the riffs that he played or any licks he might have been improvising and the holes, the gaps, would be the places for the horns to come in. And the best horn writing, whether it was for the traditional bands of uh, Fletcher Henderson, Benny Goodman, or later on uh, the uh, Stax horn section with Otis Redding, is filling, playing either, you know, chops, eighth notes, or patterns that never interfered with anything else that was going on and also featured the unexpected upbeat. Chips Moman, a fantastic record producer and composer from Memphis, always used to say, it was one of his cliché, fellas, it's in the upbeats. The other word for that is syncopation. When people talk about syncopation, that's what they mean. And James Brown was the undisputed master, maestro, king, emperor of the syncopated, of the unexpected note. Because that unexpected note, it just gives you a kick, it hits you in the spine, and you have got to get up and shake your booty, you've got to dance. That's why James Brown finally is accumulating a lot of money, because at this stage of his career, the hip hoppers are, are sampling everything he ever did, and you couldn't go to a better source.